Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, I want to thank you all for having me back a second time. Uh, it means I must not have done too poorly the first time, so that's a good thing. Um, but it is wonderful to be back with you this Sunday. Um, I do want to preface, before I get into the service, one very important thing. I tried as best as I could, but I could not think of any other good juicy secrets about Tommy when he was in college. So I'm sorry to let you down there. You'll just have to invite me back another time and give me some more time to think about it. Um, that being said, um, I, my wife did want to apologize for not being able to make it out this Sunday. She enjoyed it last time she was here, but as of a few weeks ago, we took on a couple little foster boys, um, and we have our hands full with them. So, uh, prayers are very much needed on that as well. They're uh, three and four years old, um, a lot of neglect, a, a very, very sad, heartbreaking situation, but they're doing really well, um, but we have a daughter. We don't have boys. I've never been a boy parent before, and boy, that is a learning curve, <laughs> especially two of them so close together. They are a whirlwind of destruction. Um, so anyway, with that being said, let's open with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, we come before you with praise. God, you are so good and you are so beautiful and you have invited us all together under your Son and that wonderful grace that you extend to us. And Lord, above all else, we are here to just give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, I ask that you open our hearts and minds to what you'd have us here today, this morning, that you remove anything that is not of me, that your Holy Spirit powerfully speaks to us this morning. We say all these things in your name. Amen. Our scripture today is found in Romans 8. We're going to be reading verses 5 through 10. I'll give you a second to turn there. Romans 8, 5 through 10. Starting with verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it can't. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells within you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So I wanted to pick this passage because it's been something I've been kind of meditating on in my own life over the last uh, few months. And one of the things that I found extremely convicting about this is the concept of the flesh and dwelling in the spirit and that kind of dichotomy that we experience on our daily lives. Now, what really, really struck me here is um, the lesson that I pulled from this very powerfully is, um, so for the last 10 years of my life, and thankfully not, not anymore, but I had struggled off and on with drinking too much. I was never stumbling home or anything like that, but I would always go in excess. I had friends that enjoyed it, and it was just a very unhealthy and sinful thing for me to do. Um, but I chose it intentionally. Right around the time I started getting really convicted by the Holy Spirit, saying, no, Michael, you need, this is not healthy. This is not what I've called you to do. It's not good for your spirit, right? I started noticing in my heart a voice, right? I'd have those moments of temptation to go out with a couple of friends and have a couple too many, and then I'd hear the Holy Spirit say, no, don't do that. Stop, right? That's not good for you, right? And I knew exactly what the Holy Spirit was saying. I heard it. It was knit on my heart because Christ dwells within me, right? My body is a temple of God. And then I noticed I had a choice. And I often would choose the flesh, not the spirit. And I thought that was such an interesting thing because for the first time in my life, I very palpably experienced this raw reality of the Holy Spirit prompting me to choose to walk in the spirit 
But then oftentimes I thought, well, it was a little more enticing to walk in maybe my own temptation and enjoy it for the evening. And then, well, I would always regret it, right? And go, I'm never going to do that again. But the time would come around and it would be tempting again and I would choose the flesh. And I think a lot of us experience that in a lot of different ways. I've had friends who have struggled with pornography throughout their life, and they've explained that they've had very similar visceral reactions. I have a choice, and it's more appealing to choose myself now and not the Spirit. Now, this leads me to really think about how we live our daily lives. Do you ever just start your day off on the complete wrong foot? You get out of, yeah, oh yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Thank you for affirming that right away. I do all the time. I know this temptation all too well. And this one specifically, right? I wake up and I grab my phone. That's my first reaction. That's a bad first reaction, mind you, right? Because what am I doing? I'm not going for my Bible app. I have another app called the Hallow app. It's like a prayer meditation app. It's fantastic. Am I reaching for that? No. I, I love reading the news, much to my dismay because it stresses me out. I also am a farmer, right? And I love cars. So I'm either on Craigslist looking at tractors. Oh boy, I really want a new Oliver Super 88 diesel. I used to have one. It was awesome, but I needed a little money at the time, so I had to sell it. So I just have to live with my 1650 diesel or my International or, you know, my other tractors I have, but I want the Oliver. So I'll look at that for a little bit and I'll think, well, I'm working on my house. I wonder if there's any sales on flooring or something like that. And then I'll go, well, I haven't listened to the Ben Shapiro show yet, so I better see what's going on with the world and get frustrated about everything again, right? And then my whole day is kind of set off on the wrong foot. I'll go and do chores, maybe I'll get grumpy with something, and, and it just seems like starting off, at least for me, and I know it's going to be different based off of everybody's routines, but when you dive right into scrolling through Facebook or checking your emails or looking at the news or maybe you're turning on the TV and listening to the news or watching your favorite show or whatever it is, reading the paper, none of those are inherently bad, right? But for me, and I think for many of us as believers, it sets our mind on the flesh. It's not setting our mind on Christ and the first thing that we do in the morning, right? And so, like I said, none of these are inherently bad, but because of this, we're setting ourselves off focused on us. And so, like I said, of course, for me, this is all too often. I'm looking for that next tractor, maybe to add a few cows to the herd. Maybe I'm worried about bills or the future. And then suddenly, bam! My day has immediately been set on the things of this world, and I start to get stressed. I start to get frustrated. I start to get ornery. Now, one of the things that I always prided myself in as a young kid was, well, I grew up, and my dad had a bit of a temper, and his dad had a bit of a temper, and his dad before that had a temper, and they would let it out whenever. I was always better because I wouldn't let it out around people. It was just when I was by myself which is still hurting me, right? Well, one of the things that I find that the trajectory of this day does is say the cows get out, and if I've set my mind on myself or just the worries of the world versus Christ and the Spirit, right? Setting the mind on the flesh is death and hostile to God, and so in those difficult moments, what do I do? I go out and I'm cussing and swearing at the cows, right? That's not doing them any good. They don't speak English, first of all, so they don't understand what I'm saying, right? And the temper is rising in me and I'm getting mad and nothing gets accomplished in that moment. And I attribute that almost abundantly, first and foremost, to how I started my day. I didn't start it off with Jesus. The most important thing in the whole world to me, right, and I didn't start it off with Jesus. I just went about my day choosing myself. And so the results of this immediate focus on the world is worry. It's frustration. It's anxiousness. It's stress. It's prone to get, prone to get mad while I'm working on chores. And in so doing, I become a less attentive spouse. I become a less attentive parent. 
and I become more focused on myself. And unfortunately, what happens there is I promise, oh, I'll dive into Scripture later. I'll do my devotions later. It doesn't happen. If I start my day off on the wrong foot, it's probably not going to happen. And that hurts my heart. I feel that Holy Spirit's voice calling me to walk back on the path that Christ has called me to walk on, getting fainter and fainter. And is it because the Holy Spirit is leaving me? No. It's I'm walking away from the Holy Spirit. This is my choice to walk away from my relationship with the Lord. And so, at the end of the day, through more poor choices, more frustration, more worry, the sun sets my spirit-killing sinful focus on the world. And how many of you kind of struggle with the same thing? Maybe your routine looks totally different than mine, but how easy it is, is it for us to get caught up in the world? And sometimes there are very valid reasons, right? There's a lot going on in the world right now. And I try to stay informed. I try to know what's going on. I try to pray about it. But sometimes I'm so focused on that that I forget to focus on the one thing that can remedy at least what's broken in my own heart. And that's a deepened relationship with Christ. I can't fix what's going on in the Middle East, or I cannot fix what's going on in our own country, but I can open myself up to the Holy Spirit to continually transform and heal me, right? And so I know those moments, those triggers, so to speak, that keep me from that deepened relationship, that blind my heart and close myself off a little bit more to the Spirit of God. But then there's this big, powerful contrast. When I wake up, and the first thing that I do is dive into the Word of the Lord, or maybe go on a walk and spend some time praying, I usually don't end up reaching for my phone first. I'll leave it, you know, plugged in. Don't bother about it. There's nothing good that comes from it anyway, right? I usually don't dive straight into the news and begin to worry, right? I start noticing all of the goodness and beauty that God has knit around me, and I feel uplifted. Maybe the cows broke through my fence. I'm explaining this like they get out all the time. They really don't. Well, there's one, Strawberry. She gets out a lot. But other than her, most of them stay where they're supposed to be, right? But perhaps they got out again, and I'm doing some fence mending or something like that. But instead of just getting angry, swearing or getting frustrated, right? When my heart is focused on the Spirit of God, you know what's really fascinating? I've experienced this very powerfully over the last five years working on the farm. It's like God turns my head and points me out to my bluffs out in the back of the farm. It's just beautiful, gently rolling hills that turned into trees, and then it's a sheer like 600-foot drop-off, right? It's beautiful, and it's almost as if God's going, this is yours right now. I gave this beautiful, beautiful place for you. And you can spend your time getting mad because you accidentally shocked yourself on the fence and that's your own fault, not mine, right? Or you can look at this wonderful gift that I've given you and worship me and the fact that you get to work on the fence, that you can feel getting electrocuted by it, right? That's not necessarily always a bad thing. I have a body that can do stuff. I can move, I can breathe, I can feel. What a gift that is, and instead of getting mad, I can worship. And I've seen myself do that more and more. When my heart is focused on the Spirit, my temper doesn't pop up. And it's also really funny. Part of the big difference there, too, is, say, the cows are out. There's a big contrast between how I respond in those moments. If they're out and I've been focused on the Spirit, I'll pray about it. I'll ask God, please, Lord, just help me remain calm, be patient, and for some reason, help me get them back in, right? And you know what's funny? Almost every time, they go back in right away. I don't know why, other than just God listening, right? And sometimes we think, oh, it's just a little prayer. It's not that important, right? No, I, I really think he wants to test me more when I'm getting mad. And he's like, all right, they're going to stay out for four hours now, and you're going to have to deal with it. And when they get out, and I'm just focused, and the first thing I do is just pray, there's been moments where I have the gate open, and they all just go exactly back in where they're supposed to go. And you're like, well, that was, thanks, God. 
I need to remember that next time, right? And that is such a big difference. Because when I'm focused on the flesh, when we are focused on the flesh from the get-go, when we're so focused on worrying about the news or what's going on in our lives, and again, maybe it's really, really important things. Maybe you're dealing with health stuff. Maybe there's a loss in your family that's just heartbreaking, right? Those are all very valid things. But when we don't train our mind back on the Spirit, even while we're working through that stuff, we're going to focus on us. And we're going to choose our sinful patterns versus the patterns of the Spirit. And I find that whichever one of these we choose, it worms into the pattern of our whole day. And so when I choose the Spirit, I'm often a lot more prayerful. I'm a lot more kind towards others in the way I see them. Maybe I'm frustrated about, I will not name them, but politicians, right? Rather than just being angry about those politicians making decisions that I think are ruining our country, as I'm sure many of you would probably agree with me on, but I'm going to not say anything there. What if I prayed for them? Boy, that's a radical thing, isn't it? There's a certain speaker of the house that gets me very amped up and frustrated. Oh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't going to say anything. Shoot. There are certain people that get me frustrated, but then I choose not to pray for them. I just get angry at them. But they have a heart, too, that God longs for. And it does not matter how corrupt some of them might be, God still can save them because he saved me, a wretch like me. I am a sinner eternally separated from God outside of the grace of Jesus Christ. Right? Amen. Absolutely. Thank you for that. You guys are awesome. I don't think I've ever gotten an amen before in my entire ministry. That's great. <laughs> um, and that's the thing that I'm reminded of when we're looking at this contrast of the spirit versus the flesh, right? Suddenly you start to look at people differently. You look at how you walk your life differently. And you are reminded about how finite you are, how broken you are, but how powerful the grace of Christ is. Because it does not matter how far away you walk from the Holy Spirit, how far you've strayed, the Holy Spirit's still there on that path calling you back over. Come on, come on. Let's get you back on the straight and narrow. I'll take care of you, buddy. I'm here. I love you. I long for you. And back to our passage, right? I'm going to read this again. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, all right, this is all of you, this is me, right? We are not in the flesh, but we are in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells within you, right? The Spirit of God dwells within you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But in Christ is in, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, and believe me, my body is dead because of sin, and we see that tangibly all around us, right? With health issues, with brokenness and relationships, our bodies are dying. The Spirit is life because of righteousness, right? The Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so when we focus on the Spirit, we train ourselves to live and walk in the Spirit over the flesh. We focus on those things that God has called us to do, and we're not going to do it perfectly, but we're going to hear that voice a little louder when we do stray away, too. Because the more we ignore the voice, the more we shove it away, which is probably why it took me a good eight years to get over my struggle with alcohol, right? It's a long time. It was because I kept shutting it up. I kept pushing it away. I kept ignoring it. I didn't deal with it. I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit in my heart. And eventually it got so quiet, you could barely hear it. And then I wondered, God, why do you feel so distant to me? And I heard him say, I didn't go anywhere. You're the one that walked away. Come back. You can. I'm right here. And praise God that Christ dwells within me so that even though I am dead in the flesh, I am alive in the Spirit. And that is so convicting. 
Again, verses 9 and 10. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit in Christ does not belong to him. But in Christ, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so as we kind of wrap this up, we all know our bodies will not be free from the sin and temptation and our brokenness until we are united with the Lord, right? But what an encouragement that when we do mess up, when we do stray away, when we do get stressed and burdened by the weight of this world, when we focus on the flesh rather than the spirit, we have this reminder that we are not in the flesh anymore, but we are in the spirit because of Christ within us, right? And that changes exactly how we interact with the world, how we interact with our community and each other. And it makes us look a little bit more like Jesus. And that rubs off on the next person. It might be the worst person that we've ever interacted with, but if we carry that spirit with us, we don't know what God can do, right? We can't limit him to a little box because we're a little afraid of that. And like I said, I might not like certain politicians or this, that, the other thing. It does not mean that God can't save them. And I should be earnestly praying for their salvation, right? And so I want to encourage you, church, what a gift it is for us to be on this journey together, to be battling the difference between the flesh and and longing for walking within the Spirit, but we are Christ's. You are Christ's. And be encouraged by that when life does feel like it's a lot, when you do get discouraged, or when you fall back on maybe a temptation that you've long had, right? Maybe you've had a long addiction to something, right? I don't know and you beat yourself up over it, and you hate yourself, and you get angry and depressed, remember that Christ is in you, and that His Holy Spirit is beckoning to you to walk in line with Him. And even when you do mess up, we have that grace that only Christ can give. We can't buy our salvation. Sometimes I think us Midwesterners like to pretend that we can, but we can't. We cannot buy our salvation. Christ already did that for us. And Praise God for that, right? Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing us your Holy Spirit so that even in our darkest and most sinful moments, you beckon to us to return to you. Lord, remind us of that great work that your Son provided for us on the cross, that we are not of the flesh anymore, and that though we are abound by this broken body, that one day we are going to be united with you. And even each and every one of us here, we might only see each other a handful of times, but one day we will be together in paradise, worshiping you. And what a gift that is. What a gift, knowing that we are brothers and sisters through you. And so God, challenge us this morning. Remind us of that very, very first decision that we can make when we wake up in the morning, and that is to choose you, Lord. Challenge us, build us up, encourage us. Lord, be glorified. Amen.